Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm here with Connor Beaton. Um, we're just getting set up. Let us know who all is in the comments. Share where you're calling in from, any highlights from your week so far, and we'll probably get started very shortly. Straight out the gates. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we'll talk. We'll just project so that the microphone yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. picks up what's going on. Um, but I'm so excited to be here with you. Yeah, same. Um, you know, I believe that we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. And sometimes we might not have like direct access to the types of people that we want to be uh, influenced by. Mm. And so a big part of my journey has been exposing myself, you know, through podcasts or audiobooks to the people that I aspire to be like. And it's always just such an honor when you can meet in person. And, uh, and have that experience. What's, I'm, I'm actually curious for you as you go through this journey, what's that been like to meet all of these people that you follow from the outside? Because I know that for me, in my journey, as I've met people that like the Lewis houses mm -hmm. and the Esters mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that, it's always interesting to meet people that you have uh, been in touch with, like a bit observing for a long time. So what's, what's that been like over the years? Um, I'm like putting you on the spot. No, I love it. I love <laughs> like interviewing it. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's very natural to me. It's just that these people are farther along in their journey, yeah. but we all kind of start out from the same place, you know, whether it's like a really painful experience, uh, you know, in the case of Esther, it was her family's experience with the Holocaust mm -hmm. that I think really woke her up to, are you, you know, alive and vibrant and radiant and, you know, in the erotic even embracing mm -hmm. life, or are you just getting by? Because um, so many people who survived trauma, like the Holocaust, were, you know, kind of just getting by. Yeah. Um, you know, and in the case of Mark, it was a couple painful relationship experiences. I think that was what did it for me, too. Yeah. Um, so that's actually a great segue into my first question for <laughs> Perfect. you. Perfect. <laughs> so um, your personal story was a huge impetus for um, the course that you're launching yeah. um, and the work that you're doing now. Um, can you share briefly about your story and what you mean by the word shadow? Mm, yeah. So I guess the the Coles notes. I think you guys have a different version of that here in Canada. We have something called Coles notes, which is like the condensed Cliff's version. notes. Cliffs notes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the American version. Um, so the Cliffs notes version of it is, I was I had fallen into abiding by what I call now the one rule of men. And the one rule of men is very similar to the first rule of Fight Club, which is you don't talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't talk about Fight Club. You don't talk about what it's like to be a man who's going through depression or struggling with anxiety or struggling with his health or his relationships falling apart or his business is falling apart. Uh, and so for me, I had fallen in that trap. I, on paper, had this very nice life from the outside, right? I had a great, uh, from the outside, I had a great relationship and I had a good career. I was traveling the world. Uh, I was a classical singer at the time. And behind the scenes, everything was really a sort of a disaster. Like I was lying to friends and family. Um, I was being unfaithful. And I had this huge shadow that had come from me not knowing how to really feel whole and complete. I didn't know how to self-validate, self-regulate. I didn't have the sense of self-respect that that you know we really can cultivate to be um, grounded in our life, and because of that, there was a lot of parts of my life that were incongruent and and out of integrity, mm -hmm. and that all came to a uh, a crash. Mm -hmm. My career started to dissipate a little bit. I started to question whether or not that was what I wanted to do. Um, my relationship fell apart. The woman that I was dating um, found out that I had been unfaithful, and you know, Esther talks a lot about. Uh, infidelity and why those things happen. For me, I was getting a lot of validation from sex and intimacy um, with other women. And so a lot of my worth was derived off of that. And so I saw it everywhere, right? There was no boundaries. There was, you know, broken agreements. And so when my relationship fell apart, I kept abiding by that one rule. So I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. So no one knew that my life had sort of fallen apart. I moved all my stuff in storage. I lived in my car. And it sent me on this journey where I was really curious and really wanted to understand why do we sabotage? Like why? I wanted to understand why I had done those things, right? What did had caused me to do that? At the time, as sabotage, or was it 
I don't know if I had that language. I think yeah. at the time there was just a big gaping question mark, right? Uh -huh. There was just like, why the hell did I do this? Why yeah. did I act in this way? Yeah. And when I started to connect with other people, especially other guys in my life, I started to realize that most of them had some form of this in mm -hmm. their life where, you know, on the surface it looked like they had a great business, but then when I would get vulnerable and share how my life had sort of fallen mm -hmm. apart, they would tell me the truth that their business was struggling or their relationship was struggling. Mm -hmm. And, and that a lot of people actually had this big question mark where they didn't know how to bridge the gap between who they thought they should be, who they knew they could be from a potential standpoint and who they actually were from a dysfunction standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, again, I didn't have language for it at the time. I just knew that there was this big gap between who I knew I was capable of being mm -hmm. and who I had become that yeah. had led me down into this, you know, sort of um, cavernous place in, yeah. in my existence, right? The rock bottom of the hero's journey. Right. If you could go back to the moment, um, whatever that was, like 10, 15 years ago, the moments when you were seeking um, whatever it was, validation um, or distraction mm. from sex, like what was the story that was running through your mind? Like if I just do X or, you know, whatever it might have been, I'll feel mm. like, yeah, I mean, it was a sense of, like, um, empowerment, I guess, you could say, not in a healthy way. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it was, like, if I can just get love and affection, then I'll feel okay, mm. right? Because internally, I didn't know how to regulate. Yeah. I didn't know how to give myself those pieces because my, my inner critic, my inner victim, my my inner dialogue was so unhealthy and it was so self-loathing and self-deprecating that I needed to have healthy, I needed to have, I needed to get like positive validating reinforcement from the external world because my internal world felt so shitty. Yeah. I can swear. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so that brought me to, I ended up apprenticing for about two and a half years with a guy um, who had been in my life for a while. He was quite a bit older. And he was in his early 80s, and he had studied with Carl Jung, like, way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he started teaching me about Jungian psychology, archetypes, the unconscious mind. And we started talking a lot about the shadow. And I really resonated with this concept. And so over the years, I've, I've really understood what it means. But for me, the shadow is the part of our psyche where we hide and store. I kind of think of it as like a storage locker, mm -hmm. right? Like... You have a part of your unconscious mind that is the source locker for all the things that we don't like about ourselves, that we want to hide from other people, that we want to avoid from people, uh, avoid from dealing with. Um, but the problem is that when we store some of those things in the locker, they take parts of our potential with them, mm -hmm. right? So let's say that we grew up in, in an environment, in a childhood home where we were verbally abused, mm -hmm. right? So someone said, you know, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you're not attractive enough. <clears throat> when we believe the, those things, it not only creates an insecurity that gets stored in the shadow, but it also pulls some of our potential of who we think we can be into the shadow as well. So shadow work is incredibly important because it's not only about understanding and gaining wisdom from our insecurities, about building a healthier relationship with our inner critic, it's also about unlocking some of our hidden potential that has been sort of dragged down into the recesses of our unconscious mind. Oh, so powerful. Yeah. Um, so in general, how would you say the shadow manifests differently in men versus women? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are cultural differences between how men and women are conditioned. Mm -hmm. um, I think the simplest form is women are sort of um, trained, not, not tr maybe trained isn't the right word, but women are sort of indoctrinated in some ways to be beauty objects mm -hmm. yeah. and men are indoctrinated to be performance objects, mm -hmm. right? So our yeah. mission in life is to be really performance-based driven. Yeah. And that shows up in the bedroom, it shows up in the workplace, it shows up in friendships. And so men are very, very competitive and that can create, uh, that can create an unhealthy shadow mm -hmm. where as a man's ability to perform, maybe sexually or from a monetary standpoint starts to decline, it will create a much larger shot in the background. He'll start to try and compensate for that performance. Mm -hmm. same, same with women, right? As, you know, if, if a woman really um, has been 
indoctrinated in some way to believe that beauty is like the ultimate thing, right. if she perceives her beauty to be declining, it'll start to create large insecurities in the shadow that if she doesn't deal with uh, properly in a healthy way, um, that it'll, it'll create a good amount of dysfunction and sabotage. So she'll start yeah. doing things or saying things or behaving in ways to get that external validation to reinforce that her beauty is okay. Much like a guy will act in certain ways to get validation that he's still a high performer. It's so funny you shared those examples because um, we had two questions in the group uh, just this week um, that really hit those stereotypes. Mm, so one was from a guy, Jared, he's 29. And he wrote, why do I seek sex and orgasm so much? It's almost like I can't stop. Mm -hmm. When I'm in a relationship, I still want to seek it outside the relationship. I'm generally self-aware. I've done therapy and healed a lot, but I can't figure this one out. Am I trying to fill a void or just yeah. numb out? So, but, and let me share the one from the woman. Yeah. Uh, this was one was anonymous. I grew up in an environment where women were labeled as girlfriend or hookup material. I've always been afraid to scare men away. She implied by wanting a relationship. So I pretended I'm okay with just being a hookup. Initially, it felt like empowerment, but over time I felt used and alone. Now when a man gives me the attention I crave, I get attached and fall hard. Mm -hmm. I know I don't have healthy boundaries, but I keep on repeating this pattern and don't know how to stop. Yeah, so I'm gonna deal with, I'll go with the first one yeah. first, right? With, with the, the guy's example, um, Jared's question, which is great. And this is a really common thing. So men and the masculine, the masculine specifically, I'll just speak about masculine energy because we all have masculine feminine energy mm -hmm. within us. At least that's my belief. Maybe not everyone believes that. But the masculine is always seeking for a form of freedom, right? It's always trying to gain a sense of freedom. And for a lot of men, we haven't been taught how to emotionally regulate, intellectually regulate. And so if we are feeling anxious, if we're feeling overwhelmed, sex and orgasms specifically are a sense of release. And so for, yeah. the, for the masculine, for a, lot of, for a lot of men, whenever they orgasm, there's this period of time afterwards where they feel completely empty. Mm -hmm. And there's this deep sense of freedom that comes along with that because they've, they've actually created a void, mm -hmm. right? So I think he said something about, you know, am I trying to fill a void? It's like, no, you're actually trying to create space wow. within yourself. And so for a lot of men, it's like, this is where meditative practices, breathwork practices, yoga practices of understanding your own energy body are so important because if we don't tune into those things, we'll constantly be chasing a sense of emptiness, a sense of freedom in our post-orgasmic experience, right? So our work is to start to create and empty ourselves out in ways that don't require an orgasm. Yeah. Right. So for me, and I, I totally get it, Jared, like wherever Jared is, <laughs> hoping he's watching this. Yeah. I, I get it. This was, this was part of my journey. And this is part of the work for a lot of men is that we aren't taught how to create that void, how to create that freedom within ourselves. And so we feel out of control. Mm -hmm. So sex and orgasms become the thing that we turn to, to celebrate. It becomes the thing that we turn to when we are feeling depressed or lonely. Mm -hmm. It becomes the thing that we turn to when we're overwhelmed or anxious. It, it literally becomes the thing where we, it, it becomes the escape mechanism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we need to be able to find healthy catalysts, crutches, whatever you, whatever mm -hmm. you want to term them in order to create that void within us. The second question, you know, I think is really about being um, taught and being grown, grown, I guess you could say, <clears throat> in an environment where the feminine is seen as, as something that's fleeting, right? Something that isn't um, equal to the masculine in some ways. Mm -hmm. And this wow. is, I, I think for me, I see this a lot in very masculine cultures. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see what her background is. She is um, Hispanic. Yeah. And so, you know, in Latino cultures, it's, it's, this is starting to dissipate and even out a little bit, but often in Latino cultures, cultures you see very hyper macho mm -hmm. in men that, that don't put women or the feminine on an equal playing field. And so what happens is, yeah. is if, if a woman's grown up in that environment, she's sort of taught that her worth or value um, isn't, isn't equal to a man's in mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is a sense of like needing to abandon the self wow. to give up uh, to give up 
not power, but I guess self-worth in yeah. some way, and we abandon ourselves to get that from men because that's the environment that they grew up in, mm -hmm. right? It's like your worth is dependent on me as a man telling you that you're worth mm -hmm. it. And that's, you know, that can create a lot of challenges. And so I guess for this individual's work, it's about coming back to healing the relationship with the feminine and seeing it as an equal partner to the masculine. Wow. Um, and I know um, your buddy, Mark Groves, who we yes. just interviewed, has a great course on boundaries and yes. also has just like great social media posts on boundaries. Um, so I feel like that could be a good starting point. That could be a great starting yeah. point. I love it. Um, okay. So uh, I've heard you say the first rule of the shadow or shadow work is the shadow doesn't want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And so one of the tips you've suggested is we can learn so much from our triggers and when we get reactive. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious if you can explain what that reflective process might look like in action meaning how to heal our shadow by getting curious about our triggers. Yeah, great. Um, most people have a love-hate relationship when I say this, because <laughs> they're like, wait, I have to better understand my own reactivity and like when I get triggers, like, yeah. I don't really want to do that. I want to avoid those things. Yeah. Um, but that that's the shadow right there, mm -hmm. right? As soon as we try and avoid something, we create more of it. It's like anxiety. Whenever anxiety is present, our work is actually to go more into understanding the anxiety and experiencing the anxiety because what we integrate dissipates, mm -hmm. right? What we integrate dissipates, but when we avoid, it grows, yeah. right? And so one of the main things, everyone has their own form of reactivity. I would say that there are some basic uh, areas of life in which we can start to explore this. I believe that relationships are probably the greatest vehicle for that, for that form of transformation and understanding because people become our partners become a mirror for mm -hmm. us and we can really start to see where we get triggered so um, some people's reactivity is going to be in and around uh, certain insecurities right their partners not listening to them their partners um, maybe ignoring them in some way or you know them feeling like their partner um, maybe isn't as attentive as they'd like them to be. And obviously in the group, there's a lot of cases of infidelity. hundred percent. Like yeah. And you know, I think there's a, just on that point, there's, um, I can't remember her name right now. I'm totally blanking on her. But when I did my Ted talk in Vancouver, um, mine was called the mask and masculinity. And we talked a lot about, I talked a lot about, uh, masculine archetypes. There was another woman who talked about infidelity and she said, one simple phrase that doesn't stand for everyone, sure. but something that I thought was so powerful. She said, men cheat to stay and women cheat to leave. And I, you know, I've sat with that for a long time. And I think what she meant was when men are feeling a sense of discontent in the relationship, but they're committed to the relationship, they will try and do whatever is possible mm -hmm. to maintain the relationship, even if it means going outside of the relationship, yeah. right? Because they're like, okay, I'm getting a lot of stuff met here, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna go outside. Anyway, coming back to- Yeah, and let's <laughs> say women use it as like a sabotage mechanism. Yeah, some women will use it as a sabotage mechanism, or you know, some women will feel confronted by the idea of ending the relationship, the disappointment of that, you know, I think, we're in a time and an era where it's becoming more socially acceptable for women yeah. to really use their voice yeah. in relationship. Um, and so I think infidelity has been a means of pushing a man away mm -hmm. sometimes in the past. Of like, I don't know how to deal with this. And, and, or this long period of time where the relationship has been disconnected, there's lack of intimacy has happened. And, yeah. you know, a woman naturally gravitates to someone that, that has started to fill those mm -hmm. voids for them. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back to your original question, yeah. sorry for straying. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the big pieces is we can start to notice what reactivity feels like mentally, emotionally, and physically. So we can start to look at what are our thoughts when we become reactive. Yeah. One of the main things is projection. Mm -hmm. We start to make other people wrong for our internal experience. Wow. So I'll feel angry, for example. And, you know, I'll start to blame my partner. I'll be like, you made me feel this way. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good sign yeah. that you're probably being reactive. Yeah. Because yeah. we, we, you know, want to move into a space of naturally offloading our emotional experience yeah. into other people. Yeah. That's the basis of reactivity. Mm -hmm. uh, we can move into an emotional state of understanding, are we feeling angry? Are we feeling 
guilty for something? Are we feeling, you know, hatred? Like, what are we actually experiencing that's causing that re reactivity? Uh, and then we can go into a physical sense. Mm -hmm. Some people will have very physical reactions yeah. to re reactivity, where they'll feel it in their shoulders, the jaw will get very tight and tense. And so, if people are really wanting to understand some of those signs initially, go through intellectually, emotionally, and physically. What does reactivity look like for you? And get familiar with it. That's really like the first, the first step to understanding where your shadow is showing up. Mm -hmm. And then, I think, secondly, the great indicator is hindsight, mm -hmm. is being able to look sure. back and say like, why the heck did I say that? Yeah. Why did I do that? That's not me. Any time that you perceive that you've gone unconscious, mm -hmm. that's the shadow at work, yeah. right? If your inner critic is in the driver's seat, that's the shadow at work. Mm -hmm. So we, we can become very cognizant and aware and create some sort of cognitive space to become aware that, hey, when my inner critic is coming up and I'm criticizing my partner heavily, or I move into a contemptuous space, yeah. I'm not necessarily conscious anymore, and that there are other forces within my psyche, right? Yeah. AKA yeah. the inner critic, the, the, the critic, that are at work, that are, that are manipulating my experience, mm -hmm. and maybe manipulating the, the experience of the relationship. Yeah. So I would use that as a, as a really good platform. I love it. So you guys know recently in the group there was some tension because obviously, people come to Esther's work for all different reasons. You know, some people listen to her podcast, some people see her TED talk, but other people are in the throes of a fair aftermath. Yeah. And we have people who are, you know, the other person, we have people who are betrayed, yeah. everything. And there were different groups that were sharing from a very vulnerable place about their experience. One was the other person in the affair, mm. um, and then one was the betrayed. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of triggering on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also some really great uh, stepping back and reflection and owning that reactivity in the group as well, which was really powerful. Yeah. Um, so I've heard you share a couple questions that can be used to um, to access like what your shadow side might be. Yeah. The, um, you call them psychological mad lips. Can yeah. you share what, what some of those questions you're very, are? You're very attentive. Yeah, yeah that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a great place to start is for everyone that's, that's listening, you know, you can um, find a comfortable space usually, and you can either write them out or, you know, you can listen. I'm actually creating a bit of a, um, of like a shadow course right now mm -hmm. where people will be able to dig in. Um, but a good place to start is the emotion that I'm least comfortable experiencing is, the emotion that I tend to hide from my partner is, the emotions that I least want other, to, other people to know about are. Mm hmm. Mm. That's not a good one. Mm. When I get reactive, how I usually communicate is. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Like anger or withdrawing. Yeah. yeah, I usually. I'm usually the most reactive when my partner, I'm going to fill in the blank. Yeah. So those are a couple of good ones to start, just to give you a sense of like where those pieces show up. Um, I guess another good one is when I'm feeling insecure, I tend to right. fill in the blank. Um, when I'm feeling insecure, my communication becomes, that's another good one. For some people, their communication will become hostile, reactive. Their communication might be shutting down. And so it'll give you a very clear indicator of how you respond in those ways. Uh, and then you can move a little bit deeper into um, the emotion that I experience when in conflict the most is. And so maybe that emotion is sadness. Maybe that emotion is anger. Um, what my anger is trying to say yeah. is, or yeah. what my sadness is trying to say. And the aim of this is to first understand the reactivity and then understand the emotion behind the reactivity, and then experiencing what the emotion is trying to convey, right? Not that we need to act from that place of emotion necessarily, because right. sometimes our emotions are unruly, yeah. and they're not, they're not giving sage advice necessarily, right. but we need to be the ones communicating with the emotion, otherwise the emotion is going to, to hijack us, mm -hmm. right? It can sort of take over. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that's really the point we're trying to get into. What is the emotion trying to communicate? What does it feel like? And then what is it trying to express mm -hmm. in a healthy way so that we can cognitively understand? Mm -hmm. And then once you have a sense of what it's trying to express, what do you do with it? Yeah, so, so then you can sit with it, right? You can sit with, is this true, right? Is what my emotion trying right. to express true? What's the story 
that I have about that? Right. You know, is it is it a, a false assessment? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, most of the time, because we haven't been trained how to interact with our emotions, our emotions just have a life of their own, right? Yeah. So anger pops up and all of a sudden it's in the driver's seat and it has its own form of communicating with our partner, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to be able to communicate with our own anger mm -hmm. to understand why it's there and what it's experiencing so that we can parent that part of ourselves, yeah. right? Just like we can parent ideas and, and help them grow into fruition, mm -hmm. we need to be able to parent our own emotions so that we can say, okay, this is valid. You know, my, right now my anger is upset because this person isn't hearing me. Yeah. I feel like they don't understand uh, what I'm saying and that's valid. And so then we can say, hey, I feel like you aren't hearing me. I feel like maybe you don't quite understand me. Is that true or do you understand? Yeah. And so then we can come from a, a place of uh, communicating from what our emotions are trying to say yeah. once we've seen whether or not they're valid. I love it. So there was a group member uh, who messaged me at like 9.30 this morning. He's like, please ask this question. <laughs> um, so he's really been doing the work. He's in a marriage, has uh, two kids, mm -hmm. and uh, his wife does struggle with depression, um, but also is very resistant to doing any of this work. Mm -hmm. um, and he asks, like, can you do this work if your partner is completely not open to it? And how should he manage that situation given that they have a family and yeah. you know, he's probably not going to leave? Yeah, it's a really tough situation. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people sympathize with that. Yeah, I, I actually get this question all the time. What do I do if I am with a partner who will not do the work, like just will not do the work? And, you know, I think that there are some boundaries that we can put in place with our partner. Um, but the first thing that I usually su suggest if we are being met with resistance is that what I have noticed about people that have blocks or resistance to doing the work is that sometimes there's an internal narrative or story that they need to hit rock bottom before oh. things improve. And so they're holding on to this narrative that things need to get worse before wow. they get better. Wow. And one of the things that we can do as a partner is have an open dialogue with our spouse, with our partner and say, you know, do you feel like you have to hit bottom before things improve? Do you think that things are going to get worse before they get better and they'll give you a really honest answer wow. they'll tell you they'll be like yep i feel like i need to bottom out before i can change and yeah. you as a partner can help to navigate those waters a little bit um, not by making it wrong you right. don't want to make that experience wrong um, but try and understand like what does bottom look like for them mm -hmm. you know what is the absolute rock bottom look like because then as an individual, you have a decision to make, yeah. right? You can decide, do I, do I actually want to be with this person while they ride all the way down the bottom? Or is this something that I also need to protect myself from, that yeah. I need to protect my children from? Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes, which is true, some people are hell bent. Yeah. Really, really hell bent. The shadow has taken over, the depression has taken over, and they have convinced themselves that life won't get better. Um, yeah. And honestly, you know, in, in some situations we, and I know this might sound harsh, and I know some people may not like this, <laughs> but sometimes the, the leaving is the thing that helps us change. You know, like I get asked all the time, how do I know whether or not I should leave my partner? Mm -hmm. And I did a little podcast mini episode this on, on my show, and it, it was just called How to Know When to Go, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. the basic lesson of it is that sometimes that change, us making the decision of what's healthiest for us, for mm -hmm. our children or our family, is the thing that is the catalyst for someone else's change. Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to be responsible for it. It simply means that we need to do what's best for us and what's best for family. Mm -hmm. and, and if that person is convinced that they're gonna go down that path, but they're also resistant to help, it's a very challenging situation to be in. Yeah. Um, Interventions can also work sometimes, yeah. but that's that's what I would say is yeah. first start with that dialogue and get a sense of do they are they convinced that they're going to bottom up? Yeah, I love it. So Connor mentioned his podcast, which is the Man Talks podcast. Yes, it's really one of my favorites, and actually one of my favorite episodes is the one you did with Traver mm -hmm. Bohm mm -hmm. on power dynamics. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, so one of the questions was about porn mm -hmm. and the shadow. And I was curious if, in your experience, 
what effect, if any, does porn have on either creating a shadow or growing an existing shadow? Yeah, I think it impacts both. Yeah, I think, um, you know, first off, young boys today are finding porn much earlier than ever before. You know, a lot of a lot of young boys are starting to find porn between the ages of 8 and 11, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, pretty intense. It's, it's really, yeah. and, and it's not like, the porn that maybe like we grew up in, it's like they have access to really hardcore, hardcore porn, yeah. right? And so uh, that can definitely create a shadow because what happens is that a lot of young men and a lot of young women are starting to watch porn, like 35% of porn is now being consumed by women. Yeah. And so what that does is it creates an expectation, a psychological expectation of how we as men are supposed to perform porn. in sex. Yeah. And most porn is not, <laughs> it's not real, right? It's, it's fake, it's exaggerated, right? Just like a movie scene. And so, uh, so men are conditioned when they're watching porn of like, oh, I'm supposed to perform this way, right? My, you know, my member is supposed to look this big. I'm supposed to last for this long. I'm supposed to have sex a certain way. I'm supposed to dominate in a certain yeah. way. And, and that's how they're conditioned. And yeah. so that can create a shadow in the sense that if they're not able to do that, it right. can manifest a very large insecurity, mm. right? If their penis doesn't look the same as the guy that's in porn, right? That can create a very large shadow of, I'm not good enough, you know, I'll never be enough for a woman, how do I perform? And then they'll try and overcompensate for that. Right. So yeah, I can definitely create a shadow in terms of maintaining, what was the second part? Was it maintaining that shadow or? or uh, like uh, exacerbating an existing shadow. Yeah, it can it can absolutely exacerbate it. Um, you know, I think from again circling back to what I was talking about before, it becomes the avoidance mechanism in a lot of our lives. And so when we're feeling a certain way emotionally, mm -hmm. spiritually, physiologically, that we don't know how to deal with, right. it becomes the mechanism where we can avoid having to feel that thing. Yeah, right? like the release valve. It becomes the release yeah. valve, and. The, again, the challenge with that is that if our inner critic comes up or if our insecurities come up, which are all a part of the shadow, yeah. and rather than dealing with those things, rather than knowing how to interact with the inner critic and set boundaries with it yeah. and sort of put it in its place sometime, yeah. we just default to porn. That part grows more powerful and more powerful and more powerful to the point where the only way that we know how to deal with it is by some form of an of an addictive and yeah. suppressive behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So porn can be, uh, not only that, but I think the biggest part for me is that for a lot of guys, and, and I'm speaking specifically about guys, but I think this is true for women as well, a lot of the women I've worked with, porn can be the barrier to a man having the type of sex that he actually wants. Mm -hmm. And not actually knowing what kind of sex and desire he actually has for himself because his education is based off of a fabricated version of what sex should look like. Yeah. So there's that, and then the other piece I would say is that most porn is actually designed to uh, fetishize your wounding. Right, right. Right, so like most porn is there, like if you had an overbearing mother, there's lots of porn that's designed where, I'll just give this as an example, because there's a lot of research that's starting to come out about this, and I think it's really important. There's a lot of research that's showing that the type of porn that you watch can be directly correlated to the type of childhood wounding that you have. Mm -hmm. so, so in a lot of the work that I do with men, when we talk about porn, guys will come in and say, you know, I have like, I watch a lot of porn that is in and around like my, you know, a mother fantasy mm -hmm. or, you know, a woman telling me what to do or fetishizing about certain body parts. Mm -hmm. And you can trace that back to almost indefinitely trace it back to what their childhood wounding is like, right? So if a guy is watching, I'm just gonna give an example. Uh, if an individual is watching, let's say porn where uh, they are dominating a woman in a hyper aggressive way, they can often be traced back to having a mother that was overly critical and very overly bearing. Yeah. And so it creates this psychological shadow where they have a desire to dominate a woman in the right. way that they felt dominated as a young boy. Yeah. And so we, can, we need to be very careful about how we're interacting with pornography. Mm -hmm. And I usually say for couples, it's like explore your desires, explore your fantasies, 
but be really honest about the impacts of porn. If you want to use porn in your relationship, I don't have a problem with that, mm -hmm. but you should, be, you should have a very open dialogue about your sex, about your fantasies, about your desires, and have a really strong foundation in place before porn enters in the picture. Because otherwise, it's like a, a band-aid for a bullet, bullet hole wound, right? Yeah. It's, trying to, uh, it's trying to replace the actual healing that needs to happen, yeah. or it's trying to replace the actual desires that are trying to come forward within, within the sex and intimacy of the relationship. Yeah. Um, I had a follow-up question on um, how the shadow impacts sex and intimacy. You mm. kind of hit on it, but let's go a little deeper. So let's say you might have a porn addiction and you're watching this and then with your partner, let's say part of your shadow is around that porn addiction. How would that manifest in your sexual intimacy? Yeah. So um, generally a lot of people will start to withhold, yeah. right? And they'll start to hide. Mm -hmm. So that the key to the shadow is what we, what we hide and withhold and avoid. Right. Any time that there's avoidance or hiding, that is creating some form of a shadow. Mm -hmm. So if we are, for example, wanting to explore being intimate in risky environments, right? Maybe, maybe you like having sex or want to have sex with your partner in a public place, mm -hmm. or you want to have sex with your partner in a way where there's a little bit of like a high risk because there's yeah. an excitement around that. If you are not bringing that forward, yeah. what, that, what that will do is eventually create a bit of resentment on your side, wow. right? And so there'll be a resentment built up and you'll start to either look for ways to have that need right. met uh, sexually through the porn that you watch. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's through engaging in other risky conversations mm -hmm. through social media yeah. or something like that to get that sort of um, desire fulfilled. Wow. Or it will manifest as, because when we build resentment, it doesn't necessarily need to come out of the person about that specific issue. Right. So if we're we'll feeling, yeah, yeah. If, we're, if we're feeling resentful about us not bringing our sexual desires forward, we might bring that resentment out about, you know, things around the house, right? Mm -hmm. Them not putting the dish in the dishwasher mm -hmm. properly or taking out the garbage at the mm -hmm. right time. And that resentment will start to attack our partner in other ways. Yeah. So we need to be cognizant of bringing our sexual desires forward in a healthy way. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if you don't know how to do this, work with a professional, right? This is, if you really want to have your desires fulfilled and, and brought out in the relationship, work with someone that can help you to confront these very confronting conversations. It's hard for people, it's vulnerable, yeah. right? And <clears throat> like, uh, you know, I think one of the, my favorite things that Brene Brown said was, vulnerability can't exist without courage, mm -hmm. right? Every time that we express a sense of vulnerability, we're being courageous. Yeah. And so how do we combat our sexual shadow? Yeah. Is we have to be courageous, right? We have to lean into this space of, okay, I'm gonna be a little bit vulnerable, I'm gonna be a little bit open, I'm gonna talk about what I'd like to explore and experience, mm -hmm. um, but I'm also gonna invite my partner into that space, right? Yeah. What's their sexual voice not expressing mm -hmm. to me? Mm -hmm. And start to understand that. Yeah, I love that Brene quote. She also said, shame can't survive in secrecy. Yeah. Just like along similar lines. Exactly, exactly. And there's a big difference between healthy shame and toxic shame. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this gets talk talked about enough, especially in the realm of sexuality and our mm -hmm. sexual desires. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think the, the biggest difference that, that I've noticed between the two is that healthy shame is about discernment. It's about understanding uh, what our experience is, whereas toxic shame is about disgrace, right? It's about really disgracing ourselves or our desires yeah. or our inner experience, and then making ourselves wrong for having that thought or wanting to express ourselves in that way or wanting to experience our partner in a certain way sexually. Yeah. Actually, one of the group member questions was about shame, mm. and they asked, like, what is it? Is it an energy? Because it almost has an energetic, like, physiological manifestation, or is it an emotion, or is it, like, both? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's all of the above. Yeah. Yeah, shame, shame is a, both a intellectual critique of what our actions are and an emotional experience uh, that can manifest physically. Right. A lot of people will experience shame in a very physical way. Like a flush feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For some people, it's like a, a collapsing or an imploding, right? Mm -hmm. their, their chest will collapse, their shoulders will get heavy, 
you know, they'll feel it in the pit of their stomach, yeah. like, oh, and then, and again, there is that sense of, of disgust there, you know, there's that sense of disgrace that's, that's coming yeah. in. And that has a very emotional uh, and energetic frequency. Yeah. And yeah. so getting in tune with that is important and understanding how to shift that energy into a space of discernment, right? Understanding, okay, what about this did not feel good? You know, I think we've all had that, maybe not all of us, but I think many of us have had an experience of, of acting out of an integrity on a date or sexually with a new partner and afterwards feeling like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do that. I don't know if I should have experienced this. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of questions there. And so starting to discern uh, it from a healthy shame perspective is important because it becomes the essential form of boundaries, right? If we want to set healthy boundaries, anger is, ne is necessary, but also healthy shame because we start to know where our, our line is yeah. before it moves into the space of, I don't feel really good about this. You it's know? like a car warning light. Yeah, of. exactly. Yeah. It's like the engine light yeah. going off, right? So we can yeah. always tell when our boundaries are being crossed yeah. because we get angry, right? Reactivity is there. Yeah. Or we feel like a, a, that sense of like disgust or disgrace. Yeah. And once we've moved into that space, it should be a red light of like, oh, I need to look at something and become a little bit more discerning about what my actions are or how I'm behaving or what I really want here. I love that. Um, you had said something that I thought was really powerful. Actually, it might have been Mark. It was on your podcast yeah. that I listened to. Um, you said, let the change change you yeah. versus figuring out how to change yourself to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you can speak to that as well as you mentioned that a key to all of this is getting comfortable with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, when I was thinking about that, I'm like, I'm really bad at that. <laughs> and so I was curious also if you could talk to like, um, any tools for getting more comfortable with uncertainty and how uncertainty is connected to the shadow. Yeah. So good. There's a lot in there. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Uh, yeah. I, one of my, one of my favorite sayings and one of my personal mantras is let change change me. Mm -hmm. And all that that means, there's a, there's a great philosopher who isn't with us anymore, his name is Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite lines that he says is, what if you are the way you are, and there's simply nothing you can do about it? That you just are the way that you are. And the whole essence of that is that all that we are left with is to observe, is to observe the patterns that are always unfolding. Mm -hmm. And so in this way, we sort of move with the flow of life and of change, right? And a lot of people have talked about this concept. Stephen Covey in The Seven, Highly, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he talks about the circle of influence and the circle of non-influence. Yeah. And so he says there are things that we can influence and there's a whole bunch of things that we can't. Yeah. And the things that we can't influence, there are way more of them. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about really discerning between is this something that I can influence mm -hmm. or is this something that I need to allow mm -hmm. and that I need to surrender to? Mm -hmm. And again, this comes back to being able to create a, a space within ourselves. If we're so full of anxiety mm -hmm. and worry and doubt and guilt or shame or whatever it is, we don't have space to discern between what we should be letting go of, what we can't influence. Right what change is just going to happen and we yeah. need to learn from and what, what parts of our life we can influence. Mm -hmm. And so creating that space is incredibly important right. from a mindfulness perspective mm -hmm. so that we can say, okay, this is out of my control. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how this person responds, how they behave. Right. I might be able to influence how I show up around them. This is probably important for the Christmas season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Family. <laughs> as, as we Dynamics. go home. Yeah, it's like the Ram Dass, what I posted, I actually posted it yesterday. It's like, if you think you're enlightened, go and spend a week with your family. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so how, do we, how do we start to let change change us? Is that we start to sort of surf with and notice the parts of life that are completely out of our control. And we start to get really familiar with that and intimate with it. There is an intimacy that we all need to cultivate with the unknown. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are terrified of that because the unknown in its truest form is related to death. And most of us don't want to know death, right? We don't want to know what the true unknown is all about, the big uh, unanswerable question. Um, although for some people that question is answered of, 
you know, what happens after. Mm -hmm. but, but it really is this unknowable piece. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and no matter what your belief is from a religious standpoint, you don't know what that experience is going to be like after. You don't know what heaven or hell is going to be like after. Right. You don't know what the void of life of, is going to be after this. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it is a practice of, uh, for me specifically, it's a practice of becoming intimate with and being in awe of the unknown mm -hmm. and, and being inspired by it. Like just being inspired by the fact that like, you don't know what's gonna happen today. You don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You might be able to predict certain things or fantasize or create certain outcomes, but there are, there's a whole spectrum that you just never know how mm -hmm. it's going to unfold. Yeah. And there's such a beauty in that that yeah. we miss out on when we're trying to control that part of existence. And it creates, you know, Freud and Jung both believed that this was the essence of what created neuroses, wow. right? When we try and control the uncontrollable, that's actually what produces our need to control things in our daily lives. It produces anxieties and, you know, disorders where we have to clean everything a specific way. And if it's not right, we have to go back and clean it again a second yeah. and a third time. Or our socks have to look an exact way. Otherwise, our internal experience is yeah. Yeah. That's that's our psyche not being able to come to grips with the unknown. Mm. And so have a daily practice. I meditate daily on the unknown. The, uh, cr the ancient Christians had a practice called memento mori. And all that meant was it translates from Latin to English to the remembrance of death, mm. right? The remembering that you at some point will not be here in this form exactly. Yeah. And there's a beauty in that. And so find your own version of that. Get curious about the unknown. Get curious about uh, the unfolding of life and, and everything that you don't know and start to be inspired by it and, and in awe of it. And I guarantee you life will open in a way that is, uh, that is not only sort of somewhat like revolutionary, but, but also it will allow you to move with the flow of change because you won't be so fixated and obsessed with trying to change things that you have zero control over. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm laughing because, so I work in marketing now, uh, but before that I worked in um, fundraising and business development for nonprofits. Yeah. And every single skill I learned was around like influencing, controlling, um, getting a specific financial outcome. Yep. And I noticed that um, before I was conscious to it, it definitely played out in dating. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was trying to manipulate an outcome yeah. based on like levers I could pull. Yeah. Um, and there was one other example of it. Um, I think I'm also very creative and creativity is, I see it as a little bit more of a masculine trait because mm. you're like producing and you have ideas of how things should go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've noticed that like that too is a bit of a sense of control because mm -hmm. you're, again, you're, you have a vision and you're producing and you're creating. Um, and when I heard you say that quote, it just kind of like sparked some, some ideas that definitely like an area that I want to work on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, I think it, I mean, it all depends on how we approach the, the process and how we approach the creativity. Like I think I love that, you know, some artists will come in and they will try and, or some creatives will come in and they'll try and produce a very specific outcome, right? They'll know exactly what they want to create. Mm -hmm. Whereas other artists will literally sit and stare mm -hmm. at a blank canvas for days totally. until the canvas reveals what should be painted, wow. right? Until the block, I think that's like, you know, Michelangelo or Da Vinci talked yeah. about, uh, yeah, Michelangelo's David mm -hmm. talked about that David revealed himself from the marble slab right? And that he had no idea what he wanted to yeah. chisel out of it. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's sort of the essence of like letting change change us mm -hmm. is that we just move with the sort of natural flow of existence and we, and we take a step back and in partnership, this is so hard, right? But it is a meditative and mindful practice to step back and, and to allow ourselves to not try and control our partner not try and control their outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Not try and control the way that they react or the way that they behave or the way that they speak. We can still set boundaries with them. We can still protect ourselves, right. but we allow them the space to breathe and be their own person. And in that there's a possibility of change because a lot of the times, the reason why relational change isn't happening, especially when it comes to sexual intimacy 
is because one person is trying to drive their perception, their belief into the other person. They're trying to get the other person to conform to how they believe intimacy or the relationship or communication or boundaries should happen rather than being in that space and allowing the other person to, uh, to potentially enter into it with them. Love that. That's yeah. really interesting. When I heard your quote, so I'll repeat it, let the change change you versus figuring out how to change yourself to solve the problem. I kind of saw it as we often have this idea of how our life should go. And then something like a painful breakup happens. Yeah. And that's actually like the very lesson that we were meant to learn yeah. and we resist it. And then when we surrender to it, we finally learn the lesson and stop repeating the pattern. That's kind of how I saw it. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's a, a little bit of a intellectual remodel of everything happens for a reason, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, I, I understand the essence of the saying, but I think for most people, it's so cliche and basic that they're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Everything happens for a reason. But in the moment when it's happening, it's like, I hate that this is happening, right. you know, <laughs> right. and we need to acknowledge yeah. that, that there's disdain sometimes that there's, that there's uh, anger towards the things that are happening. Yeah. But as we can start to surrender to those things, yeah. we can learn a lesson, right? Yeah. The, the lessons start to reveal themselves out of the space of, of just observing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So many good lessons. Yeah. You know, a lot of the painful experiences in my life have been my greatest teachers, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, you're kind of rock bottom moment, too. Totally. You know? um, so, unfortunately, we're getting to the end that of was, the conversation. That was quick. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity, because I know you have some great content and courses yeah. coming out. Um, feel free to share how people can find you. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, the best way to find me is uh, connorbeaton.com. Uh, C-O-N-N-O-R, and then B-E-A-T-O-N. Um, Vienna and I, if you follow Mindful MFT, she's phenomenal. She's a marriage and family therapist. Uh, the two of us have a six-week relationship course called Get the Love You Want. It's for singles or couples, oh, okay. and it goes through family systems, communication, boundaries, uh, and sex and intimacy. And so we really wanted to create like the, the ultimate foundation course of like how you do healthy relationships. Okay. And uh, so there's that. And then, you know, we have, I have men's weekends that people can come out to. Um, Vienna and I are doing some uh, couples workshops this year. Uh, we just announced one for February 15th. Oh, and great. it's going to be only for 20 couples. Um, it's almost sold out. So if you're interested, check that out. Either on my website or hers. Connorbeaton.com? That's it. Okay, great. Yeah. Do you also have a self-mastery course? Is that part of the... That's, that's in the works. Okay. Yeah, that's in the works. Coming soon. It, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We... Um, we have a, uh, a breakup course coming out soon, okay. and I have I actually have an understanding men uh, course coming out. Oh, for women. Well, yeah, it's going to be mostly for women yeah. um, because I I have a lot of women reaching out trying to understand their partner, and what I've noticed is that a lot of men come into the work when their partner takes interest in in you know kind of engaging them in that way, okay. and so I wanted to give women the tools to understand the men that they are with, that the men that are in their life, um, because I've found that women really are a great access point for men to dive into training or therapy or, you know, just any of this sort of work, getting curious about relationships and yeah, intimacy. I love it. Yeah. And I do want to give a shout out to the men in the group because yeah. we actually have so many men that are just freaking rocking the work yeah. um, and really calling their partners to rise. And so, um, you know, I feel like so often, um, there's a stereotype about men, you know, not doing the work. And so when I see men doing the work, I like to acknowledge them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think for a lot of uh, couples, like when a, when a man's able to lead relationally in some sense and like lead from a growth, a self growth standpoint, I mean, I have heard so many men and women say that it's the sexiest thing that a man can do. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's the, it, it really truly is. Yeah. I was laughing with a friend of mine who's in the group who's also a therapist. And we've had an ongoing series of questions about um, men and vulnerability mm. and men saying, like, I want to be more vulnerable, but this is what I hear, whether it's on the internet or through my friend circles yeah. about women not being interested in that type of guy. And then I had such a chuckle because I was at Mark Rowe's live event in Chicago and it was literally like this massive room packed wall to wall, mainly with women. Yeah. <laughs> and so if anything's a testament to like, you know, women are really drawn to that, you know, it's, it's that. Yeah, it's very true. So, 
Um, so I'm just so grateful for the time that you shared with us today, truly. I um, can't remember if I shared this while we were recording or not, but uh, you know, we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. And a lot of times we don't have access to those people um, in person. And so it's such a critical tool can be the podcasts we listen to, like Man Talks, or the books that we read, or the courses that we take. Um, and so I'm just so grateful to, you know, be exposed to the wisdom that you're sharing. Thank you. And uh, Vienna as well, who is often posted in the group uh, very frequently. Yeah. Mindful MFT on Instagram. And so as a note of gratitude, have you heard of a tool called a sex journal for couples? No, this okay. is awesome though. So um, I actually came across this on an Everyman podcast. Yeah. And they had a show with a Brooklyn-based couple, uh, Lavina and Caleb. Okay. So they actually met. Caleb was doing an every man group in mm -hmm. Lavina's building. And so after the group, he would come down and he would kind of chat with Lavina. And he was like cracked open and just so expressive. And, um, you know, Lavina started to develop a crush on him as a result. And one day she just decided to ask him out. They started dating and they developed a practice where every time they would have sex, they would each journal about it mm. because Lavina had like all these extra journals lying around her apartment. <laughs> and then they would come together and share what they, one thing they experienced with the other person. Awesome. And then they ended up doing a Kickstarter campaign <laughs> this year and developed this like beautifully designed journal. So some of my favorite parts are they have four agreements. Yeah. So we own our experiences, um, I statements, um, we're on the same team, we choose to be curious, uh, it's a practice, not a performance. <laughs> they share examples of like their own writing that they did, um, but like the things that they shared. Very cool. Uh, they have some guided questions and they have a cool tool called the heart meter, uh. which allows you, like, let's say you're feeling disconnected after the sex. It gives you kind of a, a template to talk about it. Um, or if you're feeling very connected, it gives you, you know, a way to share that with your partner. Nice. So this is for you and Vienna. As thank, a thank you so for much. your time. Thank you. Um, and um, That's awesome. thanks so much to all of you guys, Thanks I'm trying so to think. Um, oh, we actually just scheduled a new um, Facebook Live with Alexandra Hamper oh, and nice. Solomon, who, were, who we were talking about. So that's going to be January 9th. It'll be midday. So a lot of you will catch it on the replay. And uh, with that, thanks, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Connor. Thanks so much.